Hi, this is Amy Nielsen again here with your monthly mental health nugget. Uh, today, we are going to um, focus on uh, more specifically on mental health. Um, I had been asked to do a focused mental health nugget on the impact that food has on our mental health, um, especially as we were coming into the winter months. And it's taken us a couple months to get to this piece. But here we are um, in December. We're leading up to the holidays and we are headed into the darkest of our days. And so these days that we're in through the winter right now is the absolute most important to be mindful of what kind of foods we're putting in our body. A lot of people do not know that the, the food they put in their body so dramatically can impact how they think and feel. I mean, of course, all of us can recognize if we eat something that's not super good for us and we feel kind of sluggish or yucky after, I mean, most of us can recognize that. But there's longer term impact on on foods we eat more than just that, you know, 30 minutes to an hour or whatever after we eat something. You know, we have our junk food moment. We feel kind of sluggish and yucky. Maybe eventually our body lifts back up. Maybe we make some different choices and go eat something a little bit more nutritive and feel better. And, and we'll feel some of those instant shifts. However, there's been a lot of research over the last handful of years showing these longer term impacts of, of the ongoing food choices we make. Um, a lot of people report consistent struggling with depression and anxiety, particularly with depression I'm going to talk a lot about today because a lot of people will um, suffer from seasonal affect disorder. Um, so, you know, when the light, we have less light, their mood comes down and they struggle all winter long. And when people come in and see me and they have these types of symptoms, one of the very first things that I start working with with somebody is helping them recognize that they can on purpose seek for um, types of foods that can lift their mood because we, without realizing it, with not having the proper education, we're eating a lot of foods in our general daily life, like our, our normal standard American diet is actually a, a full of a lot of depressive foods. So I don't want you to like get into this and think that I'm like anti all foods. Okay. This is, this is not to tell you to stop eating everything and completely like only go to the bird eating diet of fruits and vegetables. But this is really to tell you that there is in fact impact of food and to actually um, observe within your own self, your unique needs for your body. Every single one of us has unique needs. Um, I'm going to even bring up ancestors here towards the end of our conversation here um, to even describe why some of those things are unique. But some of the things that are very common that we find in research is the, the overabundance of the foods commonly found in the standard American diet, like, like wheats and flours with you know gluten and things like that. Again, I am not anti-gluten. Some people have no problem with it, but there are many people that have negative impact from gluten, dairy, um, excessive amounts of corn, soy, um, and sugar, of course. Um, and though these big five right here are common culprits um, for depression. Okay. They, they're actually depressive foods. Now, of course we need actually both antidepressant and depressant foods overall and the nutrients in our body. But, but the observation that I'm wanting to challenge you today is to, to learn how to observe that balance. It's not to completely wipe all foods out, but it's really to observe what actually works for you in balancing your overall health. Um, I am going to focus though on antidepressant foods specifically because we're in the winter months. And so, um, again, we're not wiping out everything, just learning how to eat more knowledgeable and more purposeful to meet our needs. Um, it is probably not going to be any surprise to you that most antidepressant foods are going to be our really bright colors. I mean, think of even just how bright color, just seeing with your eyes, how bright color impacts how you feel. You know, you look at kids um, toys and different things and they make them on purpose bright and bubbly and fun they're eye-catching because and they're energetic so here you're looking at a variety of colors this is like the rainbow of foods right here right and take a moment and just observe the impact of those light waves of the various colors 
on how your your energy shifts. Um, now, if you suddenly feel really depressive, you might be feeling a little bit of, oh man, I don't know if I eat fruits and enough fruits and vegetables. And we might be having a little bit of a shame response. I think almost all of us could go in and go, I don't eat near enough of these. Um, and that really is true. We really probably don't eat near enough of those. Um, and yet at the same time, shaming yourself is not going to help. Again, what this is all about is learning how to, on purpose, pull in the things into your eating patterns that are going to lift your mood. So look at these bright colors. And of course, we're not going to eat all of these every day, but those bright colors in it are packed full of various types of nutrients that do different things for our mind and our body. Okay, and our deep, deep, bright colors are going to be our most effective for antidepressant. Part of the reason is, is that they are anti-inflammatory. So if you're doing your own personal research, trying to find good um, antidepressant foods, you're going to find a blend between antidepressant foods and anti-inflammatory foods. Because depression, um, there's some research showing it's, uh, it's inflammatory, uh, an inflammatory response in the body. Um, a lot of people report when they're saying depression, they're reporting brain fog. Um, that comes from that inflammatory response. So we're looking to have anti-inflammatory, um, meaning we're eating foods that pull the inflammation out of our body. Okay, it helps um, grab those nutrients, grab and heal the inflammation of our body and then flush the toxins and things out of our body. So again, you're looking for bright and deep colors. Um, I thought it was super, super interesting that our bodies were very much made for the seasons that we face and the foods that come up in our season. Some of the strongest antidepressant foods are our bright oranges. So, and I don't mean orange as in the oranges. I mean, those can be antidepressant for sure. And look at when oranges are in season for us. That's right here in the middle of the winter. Every, you know, do your Christmas oranges, give a gift of a Christmas orange box. You're giving a gift of natural antidepressants. But um, with both the citrus and the orange, of course, but also pumpkin. So who does not love yummy fall pumpkin treats? But pumpkin is naturally antidepressant. So your pumpkins, your squashes, those deep, rich orange colors, get them in your food, cut up those squashes and, and saute them or something and get those rich nutrients flowing into your body because here they're coming into season. Those are the vegetables that actually hold and sustain through the winter. If you think about it, winter squashes are often those deep orange colored squashes, you know, butternut squash, acorn squash, you know, those bright, deep, rich colors. And they're the ones that actually will hold through the winter. So go back and look at our ancestors here and how they're having to survive. They didn't have refrigerators and preservatives and all the things that we have. They had to survive by knowing what fruits and vegetables and things would hold out through the non-growing seasons, right? But how cool is that, that some of the very foods, so the squashes and things that will actually, like if you grow them and put them in storage, um, in a general cool storage, they'll hold as fresh for months, months and months and get us through the winter. And those very fruit foods are the ones our body needs most of through the winter months. So isn't that cool? So enjoy your pumpkin pie with your family and know that it too is also naturally antidepressant. And if you can reduce the sugar, that's going to help a little bit too, because the sugar is not going to help us, but the pumpkin sure is. So I wanted to talk to you really quick about our ancestors, because, you know, again, we're talking about connections, family connections, and I always like to see if I can put these pieces together. And guess what? I absolutely can with this. There's some really, really neat research out there that shows that our bodies actually very much um, digest foods most effectively, similar to the region in which our ancestors come from. Now, many of us in America, we're like kind of mutts, right? Like we're totally a melting pot of many different areas. Um, but if you look back and look at some of those areas, and if you struggle with food, if you find that you have um, various food allergies or sensitivities and things, you might find out by digging through into your ancestry, find where they came from and look at the, the foods they most commonly ate. And generationally, like, I mean, like centuries long generationally, your body was being like their, well, their bodies were being created and evolved and eventually evolved into you. And your body was set to digest most effectively in the manner that um, your ancestors were. So for example, like lactose intolerance, 
the majority of people who are lactose intolerant are we're going to like move towards the southern regions of the world whereas people who have less like the less percentage of lactose intolerance are in the northern region of the world they their bodies need that milk fat in order to survive the cold like that but bodies who um people who live in the southern region they don't need those fats they're actually their diet uh more often consists of nuts and berries and um, a foraging greens and things like that. So it, it's just really, really awesome. So take just a little bit of time and dig into your ancestry and see what they ate and ate. And you might try and just see how that affects your body and see what that does to your mood. Now, I just want to close with one thing because I am talking about food. Okay. And whenever I start digging in and talking about food, and especially when I'm looking at treating um, something somewhat medically with food, um, people will become very anxious about it. So I, I want to reiterate balance in all things. Now, I know there is a picture that is ready to come up that's going to show you a nice, well rounded picture. Look, we have the greens, we have the bright reds and the yellows and the oranges and all those things. And then we have our sweet little girl with her cookie, right? And there is nothing wrong with that picture. And there, there is nothing wrong with balancing your diet. It can also be detrimental to your mental health to have rigidity and like not being able to be flexible. If you're feeling very restricted and withheld, that's not going to help either. So this is not about only rigidly eating just those bright color foods, but just add more in. Bring more in. If you're struggling with low mood, grab some more bright colors, incorporate them into how you cook, into how you snack, have things cut up in your fridge so they're quick to grab, have a bright color sitting out on your counter. Because if you see it, your eye, it'll catch your eye. And remember, it's like positive mood food. You see it, you're going to grab it, you're going to put it in your mouth, and you just gave yourself a natural antidepressant. So that is our little tip for today. And we're going to go to questions and answers. All right. Anybody have any questions? You can go ahead and ask them in the comments. And um, you work a lot with people with um, food struggles, right? It comes up often with the work that you do, Amy. Oh, uh, almost all the time. It's almost a hundred percent. And it's not so, like eating disorders. It's just right. Yep, yeah, not specifically eating disorders, but so many people don't realize that their eating is disordered. So not meaning as in like having anorexia or bulimia, you know, one of the kind of the big major eating disorders we watch for, but not recognizing <clears throat> um, different waves of, of Im impulses, um, different mood, um, what's the word, um, shaming, waves of, of shaming that they do to themselves over the manner in which they eat. Food has become such an intense mental health topic. Well, not just mental health, health topic. Um, I mean, obviously this whole last century has been very much focused on dieting and having the, the body, you know, and, and being attractive or some sort. And it, it's created such waves, a, a roller coaster of, um, of, of eat of disordered eating, um, binge eating. And, and I'm not talking binge eating at the level that, um, people see that we see maybe in bulimia, but still waves of binge eating where people will go and say, okay, well, I'm going to like eat so good. And I'm going to like follow this plan. I'm going to do this plan. So they start to feel the pressure of restriction and it puts them into a scarcity mindset. Okay. This is a real thing. Scarcity mindset is a real thing. Everybody should learn scarcity mindset because it triggers a whole system in our body that goes, mm -mm, this is not okay with me. And then when it has the uh, presence of abundance, it will overtake it. Like, so it'll over ingest. Like, so we will feel anxious. Uh, we become anxious about food when we never needed to be anxious about food. We live in a country that's full of abundance um, yeah, we're not, we usually, we're like, <laughs> you're not forging. For right, right. right. And I totally respect that there are people out there that absolutely, that is still, even in our country, that is still the case. And so of course, that's partly why that system works, how it works is so that they can survive. But if we're living in, um, an environment of abundance, which many of us are, meaning that we can go to the grocery store and pick up food, we have a pantry that has food stocked in it. And things like that but yet we're pushing ourselves into that abundance versus scarcity mindset simply by the mental 
um, energy of restriction of I can't eat this, I can't eat that, I can't eat this, I can't eat that. Well, and I doesn't that it just as you're talking, it kind of sounds like um, that's their body's way of saying, "Listen to me." Like that's exactly what it is. It's like, hey, we're we're missing some things, and so really, the challenge is not restriction. The challenge is, is listening to your body and learning to give your body what it actually needs. So when we work with people, and again, like so, if they come in for um, depression or anxiety. Um, struggle sleeping, even focus issues, ADHD. There's so many of these things that we can really actually treat with food. Um, I'm not saying that they're all 100% food related. There's still other things there that we're going to engage. But I, I stumbled on this um, line of treating mental health this way after years of treating people, treating people, treating people, and they could only get so far. And, and then having to go hunt, like, what is some of the missing pieces here? And realizing uh, from my own experience, as well as working with people, that we can, we have to be knowledgeable and real about what we're ingesting in our body. And if we're not, then we're, we're blocking ourselves from a huge opportunity to be optimally healthy. So, but again, not in like the hyper-focused dieting. Which Just, I think that's what plans create is this, you know, it does. The yeah, it creates. And you're super aware of what you're eating. You're super aware of your calories you're counting. You're super aware and it makes it not enjoyable anymore. Right. Which right. Food is such a huge part of the human life. Like it really is. And as we, I, I can't remember, we've totally dug into this in previous ones or not, but you know, we talk all about connection. Food is uh the process of eating food, prepping and eating food is a connection ex experience. We actually, that that's part of our bonding is, uh, is preparing our food together, sitting down at the dinner table, table, eating food together. Food is a vital aspect, not just to fuel our bodies, but it is part of when we're doing the connection and bonding time with our families and friends. I mean, there's not a holiday celebrated without food. I mean, we're in Christmas, right? It is all about well, all the Christmas would, treats. That would be one of those cultural experiences that is surrendered. That's love. Like that's how people express their love. They deliver goodies, they deliver. And, you know, I don't know if you're on restrictions, you kind of feel like, oh, but at the same time, let go. <laughs> like, That's right. And it's about balance. It's not completely shutting down from doing those things. It's learning how to about like how to balance that, how to manage that. Um, saying yes, where you can say yes, saying no, thank you, where you say no, thank you, having things on you. If you find you have a huge um impact with certain foods and it i mean and that can be a reality here in the christmas season for some people you know people i work with who are very very sensitive to sugar very very you know whether they have celiacs or they have a serious gluten intolerance or dairy intolerance and that's like a huge part of so many christmas treats you know then do they go into feeling restricted when all of this is being thrown all over the place during these weeks it really doesn't have to be that way. We just have to be creative, creative and supportive, still showing our love through food, but being mindful about what and how we engage it. Like it doesn't need to be restricting in the least. Um, Olivia asked a question. She says, what's the connection between swelling and inflammation and depression? So there is research out there showing that, um, so when you're saying swelling, so edema, edema in the body, swelling, excess water, excess fluids and things in the body, that does impact the, the, the flow and function of our neurochemicals that help us manage thought. Okay. So if we don't have the right balance of, of the, the water and fluids and, and functions in our body that way, then our literally have a different, a difficult time getting those synapses to fire correctly. Okay. And I mentioned earlier brain fog, you know, that is a common thing that comes with that, that inflammation, because it makes things sluggish and hard. You know, you think about like, if you have a, an inflamed area, like maybe a inflamed elbow, you know, or an inflammation on your knee, right? Like how, how much do you slow down in bending and moving your arm when it's injured? Right. So if your brain is also got some inflammation going, be, 
And, and honestly, how does it not have inflammation going if we have inflammation through our body? Okay. That's real. Okay. So it is going to get sluggish. It's going to have a harder time with all that electrical firing that needs to happen. And that's just your body's way too of telling you, Hey, something's not right. Instead of, yeah. I guess. And it wants us to slow down and heal. Our society is the push through, push through, push through. Correct. You know, you, you know forget yeah. about that. It's not on the agenda. <laughs> right. Yeah. When we need to slow down, we need to heal. We need to ingest healing food. And so the same thing need- with anxiety too, right? The inflammation causes anxiety. Like. Again, and anxiety, that is the easy one to describe because ultimately anxiety's job is to help us know that we have a need. And so it increases the energy to help us get the need met. And so absolutely anxiety, like for one, we're going to have anxiety if we're not eating the things we need. Okay. Because our body literally, that's, it uses that as a tool to say, Hey, we're low in something. We need to go get this taken care of. Hunger is a type of anxiety. Okay. Okay. That's telling us, Hey, we're low on fuel. We need fuel. But if we don't fuel with nutrient dense foods, then we go through the cycle again, pretty quickly. But then there's obviously anxieties that come from other, other mental health reasons. But again, like, so those trigger, um, that type of anxiety triggers the stress chemicals. Okay. Uh, Cortisol and adrenaline to flow through the body, both of which are acids. So how food helps that is the antidepressant foods is, is healing the inflammation that become, that comes from those acids flowing through the body. Okay. If acids flowing through the body, it's, it's burning your body in, in an essence. Okay. Like everybody's probably experienced a little bit of reflux, upset stomach, stuff like that when they're going through a stressful, stressful time, because all that's locked up and those acids are flowing through the body. And so we need to give time to heal that. Okay, those those stress chemicals have their purpose and need, and they're fantastic when they're used for that purpose and need. But when we're having kind of that stressful life, ongoing stress, which people who suffer from anxiety, that happens regularly in their body anyways. It's firing even when it doesn't quite need to fire. And so then that's built up in their body. So all the more important to be eating those foods that can heal those area, those body that that's giving the um, nutrients for the cells to do the repairs, as well as that they're absorbing those stress chemicals and getting them flushed out through our systems so that they're not sitting in there. Oh, good timing, right when you were coughing. <laughs> I put it on mute. I was trying. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I can tell, like, I know I could go on listening to stuff like this and learn more and dig more into it. Um, but that's the basics. And if people wanted to learn more about this, do you do more with this kind of stuff anywhere? Teach more things. Um, they can always check out my website. We're in the process of building more into that to give more access to, to links to teach about these things including classes and groups that we have coming up here in the winter that we talk about these things as well, but also just do good research. There's a lot of really good research out there. Start like literally Google can be your friend in this, (laughs) but let me give that this warning. Like you want to look for research that has length of time and that is repeatable. Okay. So it's not diving into someone's fanatical or fantastic claim that if you eat this way, this is going to heal you. Cause let me assure you that that's not a real thing for some people to eat a certain way. It could heal them, but not everybody is the same. So not everything works the same. The only thing that I have found that really, really is overall effective for everyone I work with is what's called intuitive eating, where they learn really how to be mindful, purposeful with their bodies and eating to what works most effective for them because not everybody is the same and we don't all come from the same stock and the same ancestry coming from the same regions that our body was evolved to eat in the manner in which we <laughs> were meant to so there is no one way to do it but you can research and find what is anti-inflammatory if you even just google anti-inflammatory eating it's going to bring up the very things I just talked about, and it's going to give you ideas. And you can get on and search recipes for anti-inflammatory eating, antidepressant eating. So there's good research out there, and you're always welcome to check out my website for the research that we've done that we're posting up on there. 
Very good. Well, thank you so much. I'm sad to let everyone know this is our last one for the year. This and is our last, last one. one for a while, like ever, but we'll be re-sharing Amy's tips throughout the year and make sure that every, if you didn't catch them, you can go back and see them on our YouTube channel. They're on our Facebook page. Um, I'm trying to get them over to Amy's stuff too, <laughs> <laughs> but we really, really appreciated you joining us and being here with yeah. us and sharing all these um, helpful tips throughout the year. Thank Super you happy so to do it. Much. All right, everyone. Talk to you later. All right. Thanks. See ya.